The African-American legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas varied as politics, sports, aviation, business, literature, entertainment, and music. We will explore how African-Americans have succeeded in areas where they had been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and with us today is Cephas Bowles, who's general manager of jazz station WBGO 88.3 FM. How about that? <laughs> hey, I love that. I love that. And thank you. This is wonderful. <laughs> now, this is the 40th anniversary, I think. 30th. 30th anniversary mm -hmm. of uh, WBGO, 1979. Right. right. Uh, tell us about the founding of WBGO, uh, what has been accomplished over these 30-odd years, and uh, what do you plan to do in the next 30 or 40 or 50 years? I won't take the five hours that it would take to answer that question. I'll do it, I'll do it quickly. WBGO, as you know, was founded in 1979 in Newark, New Jersey. Our founder was a guy named Bob Ottenhoff. Mm -hmm. And at the time, just prior to the founding of the station, Bob was working for Rutgers University, the Newark campus, in the Office of Newark Studies. And WBGO, that is the 88.3 frequency, was licensed at that time to the Newark public school system. Mm -hmm. And it was used as a supplementary teaching aid for the public school system. But one of the problems that, that we had with the station under that administration was the, the station, which is a prized asset, was underutilized, and it mimicked the schedule of the school. So for the most part, you know, school starts at 7.30 or so, it ends at around 3 or 4, and the station, for the most part, those were its hours of operation Monday through Friday. Saturday and Sunday, it might or might not be on the air. Summers, it might or might not be on the air. Bob Ottenhoff, in the Office of Newark Studies, and several other people saw that this great asset was being underutilized, and they thought that they could do something differently with it that would serve the community, the entire community, not just the education community, in a great way. So they worked with the mayor and others in Newark, and they managed to get the license transferred from the Newark public school system to a nonprofit corporation called Newark Public Radio. Mm -hmm. Newark Public Radio got the license, and they turned that station, that, that part-time educational supplemental, supplementary tool, into a NPR-affiliated information and jazz station, WBGO. And that was the early days. They started with a staff of almost no people. Uh, they had no record library. They had no cash. It was, in every sense of the word, a ground-level, you know, grassroots organization. They also... <clears throat> In, in, in putting it together had vision and they had a belief that Newark, New Jersey, which is the largest city in the state of New Jersey, it's, it's right smack dab in the center of this New York metro area, could be an asset with an orientation of jazz which comes out of this area, this is the jazz center of the world, as well as information. And we had a very diverse group of people who were involved in the formation and in the governance because Newark Public Radio, that board, which today numbers some 20 people, consists of people from both New York and New Jersey, very diverse in terms of ethnicity, in terms of age, in terms of employment type because we wanted to reflect the community. And so WBGO began its journey in jazz. At the time, we had a commercial jazz station called WRVR. I was going to ask you about sure. that. It was on the air, and WBGO operated 12 hours a day, 18 hours a day. But in 1980, I believe it was 1980, WRVR changed form, well, yeah, it was, uh, format changed to country and western. And we hear stories all the time from people who say, I went to my radio that morning and I started, you know, at the time I, 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 was, I was one of them. <laughs> and so they, they started, you know, they were tuning their dial and it's like, wait a minute, they're hearing Wailing Jennings and Charlie Pride and they're saying, hold up, what's going on here? And all of a sudden they realize, wow, this is real, the station's gone. At that point, Bob Ottenhoff, with barely two nickels and a minimal staff, said to his staff, this is our opportunity to mm -hmm. really shine with this important American music, jazz. We are going to, I don't know how we're going to do it, we are going to become a 24-hour-a-day operation. I need you to work overnight. I need you to work in the evening. I don't know how I'm going to pay you, but I need you mm -hmm. to do it. Now, everybody was young, idealistic, and they loved jazz. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden, WBGO went 24 hours, mm -hmm. and they were doing 
immen immense numbers of things to support jazz, this American art form that we all love. And so WB Joe from day one was in the clubs recording music. That's Why? Right. Because this is legitimate, mm -hmm. serious music that needs to be documented, mm -hmm. not only for current day listeners, but for those future listeners, mm -hmm. for educational purposes. We need to respect mm -hmm. the musicians. Many people consider jazz to be the highest art form oh. that African Americans have ever created. Now that we can America's debate that. Ever created. Exactly. It is celebrated worldwide. And WBGO as the today, the sole carrier of this broad, of this of this music form on the radio full time in the jazz center of the world, really believes it's important that we document, that we educate, and that we exist so that people, both young and old, can enjoy this music. Now why do you think that stations like WRVR and other jazz stations went out of business or changed format. Why did that occur? Uh, well, I have my theory. My, What's your theory? My theory is it's, it's their commercial broadcast stations. And the managements and owners of those operations believe that they can make more money with their commercial asset than they could with jazz. Because let me be honest with you, not everyone in the population likes jazz. Years ago, jazz was a mass appeal, you know, very popular art form, but because of the lack of exposure and a number of other factors, it fell not necessarily out of favor, but out of the mind of people, and other art forms were elevated. You mean country and western are more popular than jazz? Well, somebody thought it was. Um, it was a business decision well, that they made. rap is more popular than jazz, probably. Absolutely. There are more of those records being sold than jazz. Now, again, you know, we can debate, you know, is jazz more popular than this form or that form, but the reality is the people who owned the stations thought that they could do better with their broadcast asset by switching to another format, and so they did. And jazz, as a result, declined on the air in the sense of, you know, at one point, I remember I grew up in, in Jersey, and so I, you know, I've been around this area all my, well, most of my life. And when I was young, I used to listen to WLIB mm -hmm. and WRVR, yeah. WKCR, yeah. WBGO, mm -hmm. WBLS when Frankie Crocker was there right. was doing jazz to 360 degrees of sound. So there were many places you could hear jazz. But go forward to 2009, and the only place you can really hear jazz on a full-time basis is WRVR. Excuse mm -hmm. me, it's not WRVR, it's WBGO. <laughs> wish it worked. Yeah, WRVR <laughs> is long gone. And so and so we feel a special responsibility at WBGO to maintain this format. Now, because we are a non-commercial station licensed by the FCC, we depend upon listener contributions. And so that's a different business model, which allows us to, in some ways, you know, not be totally beholden to the mm. commercial model. You know, we don't need to maximize the audience in order to, to, to get greater commercial um, uh, uh, monies for the commercials that we're trying to sell. What we need to do is we need to be able to break even in terms of our budget. Mm. WBGO operates on a $5 million a year budget. It's the largest jazz format station in the United States. It's also one of the largest public radio stations mm. in the United States. We, we take great pride in that, and we take spe special pride in the fact that listeners can hear the station today not only via broadcast at 88.3, but they can also listen to it online at WBGO.org. And you have a worldwide audience. Exactly. I, I'm, I'm a listener both online and on the air, and you do have people from all over the world listening to WBGO online. Oh, we do. And let me tell you a great story. Um, a year ago, I was in my office in Newark, and the secretary called me and said, or the receptionist called me and said, there's a guy here who just came over from New York who wants to talk to you. And I said, she said, he's, he's from Thailand. And I said, excuse me? She said, yeah, he wants to talk to you. So I went downstairs, and I met a guy. His name was Dietrich Munt. He's a German national who relocated from Germany to Thailand. Uh. He met a Thai woman, and he married her. And what he said to me was, quote, I am not an unsophisticated man. I left Germany to do serious work in Thailand, and, you know, I've, I've embraced that culture, and I love it. I also love jazz, and because in Thailand we don't have a jazz broadcast station, I've been looking on the internet for jazz music. And I happened upon WBGO.org, and I heard this wonderful sound, and I started hearing about the education 
uh, you know, the, uh, educational things about the life of the musicians, the different periods of jazz, different styles of jazz. You do these hour-long interviews. You do these programs that you produce or that you get from National Public Radio from other places. You do contests, and your announcers are so knowledgeable. And I started listening more and more, and I must tell you, quote, I listen to internet radio from around the world, but the best radio that I've heard for jazz in the world is at WBGO.org. Well, of course, you know, my head blew up, and it's like, well, yes, you know, thank and you very much. And, of course, much. he gave you a contribution. He, he did give us a contribution. He did give us a contribution, and his wife was nodding. His wife is Thai, hmm. and he was nodding. But the fact is, this gentleman was a member, is a member of the International Rotary Club, mm -hmm. and he decided... I have a free afternoon. He was, uh, I think, the Sheraton Hotel on 52nd and 7th. Yeah. He goes down to the street, hails a taxi, and says to the cab driver, I know that Newark, New Jersey is around here someplace. <laughs> Take me to it. $72 later, he gets out in front of our building, comes in, spends three hours with us, uh, and continues to send us emails telling us he's listening. I mean, that's the power of radio, the power of jazz, and the power you know, of people. You know, this music brings people together. I don't care where you're from. If you hear jazz, probably at some time in your life, you're going to say, you know, that's not half bad. And of course, with the jazz being America's contribution to the cultural world, exactly. it's in commercials, it's in movies, it's all over the place it's now. It's ubiquitous, yes. It really is. How long have you been with WBGO? Well, I, I, I've been with WBGO. Well, I should say, as I said, I grew up in Newark, so I listened to WBGO mm. when I was a product of the Newark public school system. I left this area in 1978 to go into public broadcast, and I went to Arizona. Mm -hmm. They hired me to manage WBGO in 1993, mm -hmm. which is 16 years ago, and so I've been here ever since. Mm -hmm. Well, there are many people in the New York metropolitan area who depend on WBGO for their identity with jazz. You have the jazz calendar, and one thing you do is you identify the people who play on the music, on the records, and recordings that you uh, put on the air. Sure. You indicate who the trombonist is, who the drummer is, and so that's on. That's important. And that's good for the musicians, and it's also good for the aficionados like myself, who want to know who's playing that and how they played it and where they played it. So that's a very positive contribution. Now, how do you decide on your format? You have all kinds of shows on mm -hmm. there, uh, WBDO. How do you decide on those? Well, we use a number of techniques. Uh, in the early days, it was all gut level. It was, you know, somebody, knowledgeable well, people. Well, gut. <laughs> well, yeah, knowledgeable people who thought, um, we need to give people the, the, what we consider to be the best of the music. And so they would look at things like playlists from, you know, that they'd see in the record stores or that they would, uh, you know, read about in Billboard. What are the things that are selling? What are the things that people are talking about? And they'd play that. Uh, and, and for the most part, that's how we program the station. The announcers, and I have to say this, the announcers at WBGO are very different from the announcers at other commercial music-based stations. Our announcers actually have to know the music mm -hmm. because they are selecting the music themselves. But over time, we developed, we, we, we put a few pennies together and we actually started doing some research researching what it was that so-called jazz listeners like to hear. Now, we didn't abandon the gut level, but we informed our gut level decision making with some of this empirical research. And what we found was we weren't half bad. You know, we weren't programming as much what I call vintage or older jazz as the audience told us they wanted to hear, so mm -hmm. we added a little bit more of that. And the vocal music that we were playing, that was about right. And WBGO sound is pretty much centered in that bebop post-bop era of the of the 60s, 70s, 80s, if you will. And so um, the announcers, so we created categories of music that we play every hour. And the reason we do that is we want WBGO to have a consistent sound so that if you, Roscoe Brown, tune in on a Tuesday at 9 a.m. in the morning and then you don't come back until Friday at 11 at night, what you heard that initial time is what you're going to hear that second time, so you'll keep coming back. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not selling out. That's just good programming. Mm -hmm. And so we developed categories of music, so vocal, new releases, big band, 
uh, what we call vintage, which is an older um, uh, you know track of music. And there are, there are type there are selections that go in each of those categories, and artists that go in each of those categories. So what we tell our announcers is, you have to play these from these categories in this order but you pick the music from each of those categories. Mm -hmm. So that means you've really got to know no, the difference no. between an Ellington and a Basie sound or an Ellington Definitely. and a Maria Schneider Definitely. sound, if you will. You know, Definitely. you can't just wing it. And, and, and our announcers are some of the most knowledgeable people in jazz that I've ever met. Yeah, well, the people like Michael Bowen and Rhonda Hamilton and so Fabulous. on. Fabulous. They, they know it like the back of their hand. Exactly. And they know the musicians, and mm -hmm. they always have a Gary Walker has a story to tell in the morning. So you get a feeling mm -hmm. of that that they are in it just like you are in it. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, and certain times, you can anticipate certain shows. Like mm -hmm. on Saturday, you yeah. have Felix Hernandez and his show, which the everybody is race for. Oh, yeah. You know, it, it's interesting. When I worked in public radio in Arizona, uh, and I loved my time in Arizona, and that's where I really was exposed to what we do in public radio, a non-commercial presentation of, of these significant art forms and, and cutting-edge information. Um, I was the expert in jazz, and I wrote a jazz column for our program guide, and I was the MC at all the events in town, or many of the events in town. I came to WBGO and I ran into the Walkers and the Bournes and the Bob Porters who've been... Bob Porter the Blues, yeah. Bob Porter the Blues. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you know, Bob Porter was just inducted I into read, the Blues Foundation yeah. Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know how many radio stations have people who can actually say they are in the Hall of Fame mm -hmm. for the music that they program. Mm -hmm. Bob is with a number of people like Etta James and Irma Thomas. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was wonderful, B.B. King. But anyway, I came to WBGO with all of these experts. And I realized, <laughs> even though I thought I had significant jazz knowledge, in comparison to the announcers, who are, who are great presenters and entertainers in their own right, because it, the listening experience is a, is a pleasurable experience, and our announcers must be able to not only impart that serious information about jazz, but they must entertain you and keep you mm -hmm. listening and informed. And so I took a back seat and realized I better study some more and better listen more. And it's amazing when you go to a WBGO event and you start talking music, how many people know the nuances of jazz? Mm -hmm. And that's exciting. Now, that's not to say it's exclusionary because you, you, know, you can enjoy the music on many different levels. Let me ask, uh, uh, what's your total listenership? In, in uh, the broadcast audience varies between 300,000 and 400,000 different people each week in the mm -hmm. New York metro area. Mm -hmm. And there's another 50,000 or so each week who are coming to us online. Mm -hmm. Now, your fundraising, mm -hmm. every, uh, I guess, six months you have a fundraising drive. Tell us a little about that. Okay, well, one of the ways that we support ourselves as a nonprofit 501c3 organization is through membership. Now, we have many revenue streams. Now, grants and, and from corporations and foundations are important. And from Newark uh, and from New Jersey. You know, right, governmental grants. The Corporation for Public Broadcasting supports us and Channel 13 here in New York mm -hmm. as well as New Jersey Network. We get a little bit of money from the New Jersey State Council on the Arts, but the largest share comes from listeners. And so membership, those campaigns where you hear the person asking you to call a number to make a pledge in an amount of your choosing. We do three of those a year, so it's approximately every four months. The goal is $2.1 million uh, at WBGO of our $5 million budget coming from those appeals. Now, we could talk about, you know, on air we're going to raise this much and off air through mail and direct mail and acquisition and all that, we'll raise another portion. Now, if anybody is uh, watching the show uh, and they want to make a contribution uh, or want to contact the station um, other than WBGO.org, what numbers would they call? Well, they could call, if they wanted to call us, it's uh, the, the, the toll-free number is 1-800-499-9246. And the toll call would be 973-624-8880. Now, do you want opinions from the listeners as well as money? Always, <laughs> because that's the way that we grow and understand what, what they want. We are about to do some surveying on our website because we are very 
curious about listener needs and desires because we as a radio station have to evolve with the audience and mm -hmm. taste. And so some of the older listeners are, are passing away and there we, we need them to be replaced by other listeners coming in, younger listeners or those people who discover jazz because they're, you know, they're just tired of the other musics. I was in the barbershop not too long ago and a 37 year old guy was arguing with one of the barbers. I go to a hip hop barbershop and he said to the barber, look, I'm not a kid anymore and I can't listen to that type of music and I won't define what that type of music mm -hmm. is. He says, I need something more adult and something that I can relax to and that will intellectually challenge me. And so he was talking about jazz and a few other uh, music forms. But still, I think sometimes, and, and you know, I hate to say that something is for kids and something is for adults, but I think your, your musical tastes change. And some might say mature, but you know, they, they can change over time. And jazz is one of those art forms that when you hear it, you know, it's like you'll have some type of reaction to it. And you just need to find that, 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 that form you know, be it vocal, be it big band, be it small group, be it something uh, uh, modern, be it something from that, that 60s, 70s, 80s period. You're going to like it because jazz is a music that it sounds good to me. And mm -hmm. I have more <laughs> neck pecking and foot tapping in my car, in my home, and my wife. Mm -hmm. Who is a, a she, she, you know, she wasn't really a jazz person until she met me. And well, let's now, talk about jazz in American society and mm -hmm. culture. As I said, it's in all commercials, it's sure. in the background of movies, etc. Why is it that jazz musicians don't get the respect that some of the uh, more popular musicians get? What is the reason for that? Well, I don't know the reason, but I, I think some of the reasons are the lack of of people recognizing the significance culturally of this art form in America. What about the fact that it's hard to, to hear it? Do you remember the old jazz club? Sure. You go and you went down the, yeah, the, in the basement, steps yeah. in the basement yeah. and so on. There are very few places that you can just go and hear jazz now. Well, that's true. We have a great, we have a, several great places in New York. Of we course, got Lincoln the, Center. That's yeah. the, you know, jazz at Lincoln Center is the biggest facility that we have, but we have storied uh, small clubs like the Blue Note and Birdland, you know, you have the Iridium. I mean, they're all helping and jazz And you do a show at the Vanguard, do you not? We do. We, um, uh, every month we do a live broadcast for NPR, They're the NPR music website that we also broadcast of, of pretty cutting edge music from that mm -hmm. venue. Lorraine Gordon, the owner, is, uh, you know, was honored by WBGO at its 2008 gala and is a good friend of the station. We honored her because of her long-standing commitment and support of jazz. Our gala, by the way, is called the Champions of Jazz Gala. When, and is it, when does it occur? It will be November or late October, early November this year, mm -hmm. and it will be in New York City. They'll, we'll have announcements on the air um, about uh, the event. And you have certain special programs honoring certain groups or certain historical points in mm -hmm. jazz. Sure. Uh, what was one of those or recently? What's one that's coming up? Well, we, we have a wonderful tribute to Benny Goodman that's going to be taking place across three mm -hmm. days, the end of May, May mm -hmm. 26th, May 29th, and May 30th. We're looking, we have interviews with, with, with uh, people uh, who played with Benny Goodman and who were influenced by him. For instance, Paquito de Rivera is someone who comes to mind. And Paquito so when he was in Cuba, he used to listen to Benny Goodman records. And you, as you know, he plays alto sax, but he also plays clarinet. And that's mm -hmm. a direct result of his influence, the influence of Benny Goodman on him. So he has learned quite a bit about Benny Goodman and, and the work that he did. And so we do interviews with him. We've got a wonderful documentary on the 26th that will showcase the, the life of this great musician. Now, Benny and then, Goodman was if I may, one of the leaders mm -hmm. in integration yes, of he was. blacks into the music world oh, absolutely. with Lionel Hampton and Teddy Wilson. Lionel and Hampton was a board member of WBGO when I first started. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what are your plans for the future? You've done, done a lot and you're still doing a lot. What are some of the plans for the future for WBGO? Well, you know. You're going to have your tower. Tell me are, about that. The tower. <laughs> There are so many things. I, I get excited when I think about it. WBGO, for years, you know, f since its, 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 its beginning, was based, the tower was based in Newark, New Jersey. And while we're 428 feet height above average terrain and we can get into Manhattan, we couldn't penetrate this 
city in the way that we want it. And Jersey, you know, has fairly good coverage. But in order for us to fulfill our mission and mandate to get jazz to the people, we thought we needed, and, and New Yorkers told us we needed to do something about the transmission in Manhattan. So we have been able to put together a plan with the FCC's permission to relocate our transmitter, just our transmitter, from downtown Newark to some point here in Manhattan. It will probably be on the east side, sometime, someplace in the midtown area. And we will be 900 plus feet height above average terrain, which will give us more than twice the height. And FM is line of sight, which means we will now finally be able to blanket Manhattan with the signal that Manhattan deserves. We'll still be able to serve New Jersey. We'll probably get out a little further in Connecticut. So we are enhancing and expanding the signal of WBGO in order to expand the reach of jazz to people who deserve to have a jazz radio station. Now, how are you getting the radio. funding for this? Well, we're going to have to fundraise for it. And we need people who are very much interested in having a stronger signal in New York City and in having jazz on the radio come forward and talk with us about how they might be able to work with us. And they can contact me at the station. You know, we're at 54 Park Place in Newark, New Jersey. And we gave the number before, but I'll give it again, 973-624-8880. And those people who really love jazz should really tune in to WBGO 88.3 FM. We've been talking today on African American Legends with Cephas Bowles, who is the general manager of the station. Thanks for being with us, Cephas. Well, thank you. Great opportunity.